All right, folks. So uh, just in case you were worried that uh, this was just going to be an hour of you staring at me looking off into space, um, I couldn't keep that up for an hour, although that would be kind of a fun bit of performance art if I ever wanted to try it. Um, that's that's how I become a YouTube celebrity. Um, just make it so bad that no one will want to watch and yet everyone will want to watch. So uh, if you are here, um, some of you are from my class. Some of you are from all of the other wonderful chemistry classes at Wyndham High School. If you're tuning in from somewhere else in the world, well, uh, welcome. I don't know why you're here, but I hope you enjoy. Um, we are here to review uh, a few aspects of what we've done in this most recent unit. Uh, in this unit, we've covered the structure of the atom. We've covered the concepts related to isotopes. We've covered the history of the atomic theory and the, the different scientists that were involved in helping us to understand the structure of the atom. Um, hi, Natalie. I'm so glad you made it. Um, are you watching from the bus? That would be very exciting. Um, and so if you're from wherever you're watching, whether you're watching from Keene or from your own house, welcome. Uh, we'll talk about the structure of the atom. We'll talk about the periodic table. Uh, we'll talk about all of the scientists that helped us get to our current understanding of the atom. Um, so a lot of you have already figured out, most of whom are my soccer players, that you can go ahead and chime in in the chat box over there, I would ask you to try to keep it kind of business-like because I want to be able to see the questions that people ask to be able to answer them as efficiently as I can. If you prefer not to um, ask questions in the chat box, feel free to send me an email. I do have my email open and I'm watching for that number in my inbox to change. So we can we can do it that way. You can ask right on here. Um, if you have my number, I suppose you could text me. Um, any any of those methods would work just fine. So um, without further ado, um, let's just kind of walk through the history of the atomic model. Uh, there were a lot of scientists, unfortunately all male, sorry ladies, that helped us get to our modern understanding of the atom. Um, and it sort of started way back in ancient Greece. Uh, there was this guy named Democritus, who you may have heard of, uh, who first sort of characterized what he considered to be the fundamental building blocks of all things. Um, and he used a word to describe them that meant indivisible. And that word was atomos. Um, of course, you can understand how we got the word atom from that. And so he considered these atoms to be indivisible, indestructible components of all things. Um, he wasn't overly scientific about it. For instance, he, he thought that, you know, cheese was made of cheese atoms, for example, um, which is kind of a weird thing to think about. But um, although cheese atoms are my personal favorite atoms, um, he didn't obviously have a formal scientific method to work with, but he did. He was the first person in recorded history, as far as we know, to describe the idea that atoms were made, all atoms were made of these things. Um, it wasn't until really the, the 19th century until we started to understand a little bit about what those things were made of. Uh, John Dalton came along. He was an English school teacher. Shout out to my teachers. Um, and he was a really interesting dude. Uh, he studied the weather. He was colorblind. And so he studied colorblindness. Shout out to all my colorblind friends out there. Um, and he came up with the first modern atomic theory. And his whole thing was that um, atoms were indivisible and indestructible components of matter. Um, all atoms of an element were the same. Um, that is, every single carbon atom in the world had exactly the same stuff in it. Um, and he also said that atoms of one element were different from atoms of any other element. And the big thing, and this is still true today, this is basically all of chemistry. He also said that when 
chemical reactions happen, they happen because atoms are separated, joined, or rearranged. That basically is chemistry. Dalton was way ahead of his time in, in thinking about the way that atoms interacted with one another. He was wrong on a couple of important points, though. Um, the first thing he was wrong about was the fact that atoms were indivisible and indestructible. Because along came J.J. Thompson. Um, I know in in my class and in most of the college prep classes in the last few days, we've really kind of backtracked to talk about J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson, kind of a hugely important guy. Um, if you look up a, a video, I forget exactly where the video is, but it's on YouTube. Shout out to YouTube for allowing me to do this. Um, there's a really cool video. It's probably about two minutes long of a chemistry teacher, much like myself, um, demonstrating a cathode ray tube. Now, a cathode ray tube is a really old technology. It was used in old school TVs. And it's basically kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's a ray that of a, a beam of light, basically, that was used in old school TVs to project an image onto the screen. And they were obviously in existence. Um, around the turn of the century when J.J. Thompson was doing his work, and he figured out a couple things about these cathode rays. First, he figured out that they were particles. Not only particles, but very small and negatively charged particles, because he, he played with magnets, he messed around a little bit, and found out that um, negative charges sort of deflected them away, and these particles were attracted to positive charges. So he figured out, that these small negatively charged particles were like way smaller than the smallest atom. In fact, they were like almost 2000 times smaller than a hydrogen atom, which is the smallest atom around. So by doing that, he discovered the electron and sort of refuted Dalton's whole thing that atoms were indivisible and indestructible because they weren't. Clearly there was this thing that was much, much smaller than that atom. So he came up with what what he called the plum pudding model of the atom. He's British. Plum pudding was a popular British dessert. If you look up plum pudding, it doesn't sound that great. I like to call it the chocolate chip cookie dough model of the atom because, well, chocolate chips are delicious. And cookie dough, also delicious. Um, who's with me? Um, so we can think of Thompson's model of the atom like a big ball of positive charge, kind of like the dough. And the electrons, which he called corpuscles at the time, pity that name didn't stick, um, were negative charges that were sort of mixed in evenly like chocolate chips in cookie dough or like raisins in plum pudding. Um, and that was the prevailing model until a guy named Ernest Rutherford came along. Now, Rutherford, we've talked a lot about the last few days. He was the guy who was... Sorry about the uh, the objectionable content here. Um, and I'm just going to keep an eye on that. So if you have any friends that are messing with this, don't, don't let them. Um, so Rutherford came up with his gold foil experiment. And he came up with this experiment where he found a source of alpha particles. Alpha particles are positively charged nuclei of a helium atom. So they have this positive charge and he was going to shoot them at the atom. What he figured would happen if the, if the plum pudding model was correct, if his model of the, if Thompson's model of the atom was correct, was that all of the alpha particles would go straight through because the charges kind of canceled each other out. So if, in fact, Thompson was correct and there was this big ball of positive charge with electrons mixed in, then the alpha particles, these positive charges, would just go straight through. What he found was, like, totally different. What he found was that when the alpha particles started approaching, most of them went straight through like there was nothing there because there was nothing there. So his first conclusion was that the atom was mostly empty space. His second conclusion was that whenever they would get close to something. He hadn't figured out what it was yet. The alpha particles would deflect off at these crazy angles. Like they'd go and just veer straight off or come straight back toward him. All sorts of crazy stuff was happening. And he knew that 
these things would have to have been positively charged because they repelled. Clearly, it was bouncing off something that wouldn't allow it to be attracted into whatever it was. And so he found that the mass of an atom and the charge, the positive charge of an atom, was concentrated in this tiny little spot. And he called this spot the nucleus. So Rutherford's model of the atom, which we call the nuclear model, included a nucleus, a very small positive center of charge in the middle of the atom. Uh, so most of the mass and all of the positive charge in an atom is in fact found in the nucleus. This changed the whole game. Then um, Rutherford had a buddy. His name was Niels Bohr. Um, and Niels Bohr was one of the ones who started to figure out where the electrons were. Most of the models of the atom that you learned up until this point were Bohr models, where you have the energy levels, the orbits around the nucleus, um, and first energy level fits two, second energy level fits eight, um, third energy level puts eight, includes eight, um, all of that. So, um, the, so his model worked pretty well for hydrogen, didn't really work for anything else. Um, so along comes a guy named Erwin Schrödinger. Um, you college prep folks don't need to know a whole lot about him, but we did talk about him when we talked about orbitals, these areas where, um, the electron is likely to be. Electrons are super small. They move super fast. So rather than moving in neat little orbits, it's not quite that simple. They move in kind of electron clouds, we call them. Uh, and so our modern model of the atom looks kind of like the, the opening sequence to the Big Bang Theory, um, where you see this atom kind of whipping around the nucleus, uh, the, the electrons rather, whipping around the nucleus. And that is the atomic model that we have today. So if any of you have questions on any of that, uh, feel free to hit me up in the chat box. Hopefully we'll be able to kind of fend off these trolls here um, and we'll have a good little chat. Um, okay, so now that I am rehydrated, um, so Peyton Fernari asks what the periodic law is. So uh, that would be a good segue into talking about the periodic table and the trends that we can learn from the periodic table. Um, first, I'll uh, touch briefly on Nate's question. Uh, Erwin Schrodinger uh, came up with what we call the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Uh, we all all, all our classes talked about the quantum mechanical model. And basically what it said is that Bohr's model where we have these neat little orbits of electrons mm -hmm. doesn't really work all that well. Um, it works for a hydrogen atom and nobody else. Um, and so the... Why am I blanking? Um, the quantum mechanical model basically states that there are these areas called orbitals, these three-dimensional spaces where electrons are going to be whipping around and where nine, about 95% of the time they're going to be found. Uh, the math involved gets really complicated. The shapes of the orbitals get super funky. Um, you've also talked in your classes about electron configuration a little bit, and that's sort of where all that electron configuration stuff comes from. That's not something we've covered with our classes, but... Um, that's the orbitals are what he came up with. So that was, that was his whole thing. Uh, the cathode tube, the cathode ray tube was JJ Thompson. He was the one who came up with that. Um, and so, um, let's talk about the periodic table. So the periodic law basically states that we can predict the properties or how the properties will change for a given element based on its position in the periodic table. So um, I've printed out an older periodic table here. It's pretty similar to the one you've probably been using in class. And you can see here that we have atomic numbers. Um, the per modern periodic table is arranged, arranged by atomic number. Uh, the atomic number obviously tells you the number of protons in an atom. For a neutral atom, one that has no charge, it also tells you the number of electrons. Um, 
So unless you're dealing with an ion, um, there is, and unless you're dealing with an ion, the number of electrons and protons should be exactly equal. Um, so the number of neutrons would be calculated by simply taking the mass number, uh, which is usually given to you for a certain isotope, and simply subtracting the atomic number. Because as you know, the mass of an atom is calculated by adding the number of protons to the number of neutrons. Um, so the masses on the periodic table are not whole numbers. Um, that's because these masses are weighted averages of all the isotopes that exist for a given element. Some elements have two isotopes. Some elements have dozens of isotopes. And so, again, the math can get pretty complicated, but the way they've come up with these numbers is by taking into account the mass of each isotope and how much of it exists in the world. Um, the, so, for instance, carbon. Uh, carbon on this one has a mass of 12.01. So you can probably guess that most of the carbon in the world has a mass of 12. Um, some of the carbon in the world has a mass of 13. Some of it has a mass of 14. That's the radioactive stuff. That's real fun. Um, and so, but the percentages of those are relatively low to the point where the average of all those ends up being about 12. Um, honestly, not sure on the honors version of this test, if you're going to need to calculate average atomic masses, um, in my college prep classes, you won't need to do that. Um, so, um, Lauren, I'm going to table your question for a little bit. That's an honor specific question. So we'll, uh, we'll kind of table that for a little bit if there's time. Um, because I do want to kind of segue to the periodic table and make sure I stay on track. Um, uh, any of you who know me know that I will get off topic if you let me. So don't tempt me. Um, so, um, if we look at the periodic table, we know that the periods go straight across from left to right, and we know that the groups go up and down. So the, the groups are vertical. I don't know why I couldn't remember that word. And the periods are horizontal. So I would like, uh, this is kind of a, uh, this is my version of the colored periodic table that I had, that we had our classes fill out here. Um, want to highlight a few important groups in the periodic table. Um, the alkali metals are group 1A on the periodic table. I think you can see the Roman numerals above each group here. I'll actually grab the other one and talk about that in a minute. Um, the alkaline earth metals are group 2A right next to it, starting with beryllium. Uh, then if we go all the way to the other side, we have the halogens in group 7A, starting with fluorine and the noble gases, starting with helium in group 8A. Um, now, in general, uh, this staircase line here, this dark line right here, allows us to separate metals from nonmetals. And the, the elements that exist exactly along that line are metalloids. They're elements that have sort of properties of both metals and nonmetals. That can be really useful in making like semiconductors, computer chips, things like that. Um, some other special things to look for are the transition metals in here. Uh, we haven't talked a whole lot about these because they get a little tricky in terms of how their electrons work. So we'll talk much more about those in January when we come back from the holiday. Um, the inner transition metals are all down here. These, out, uh, these ones outlined in purple. Uh, we have the lanthanide series and the actinide series down here. We don't talk about a ton of those, but there are some pretty important elements down here, like uranium, for example. We'll talk quite a bit about that this year. Um, and aside from that, uh, what the periodic table can really do for us, well, a better question, a better question would be what can't the periodic table do for us? So, um, so let's see. Um, this periodic table uh, was devised by a great Russian man um, who, by all accounts, was kind of a curmudgeon, kind of a mean dude, but uh, went through some stuff, had like the worst childhood. 
and came out and like revolutionized the world of chemistry by organizing these elements by their atomic weight. Uh, so he used two properties, uh, Dmitry Mendeleev. Uh, he used atomic weight, um, which we now know as atomic mass. Uh, today, we arrange the periodic table by atomic number. Um, and he also used something called combining capacity, something we're going to learn when we get into forming compounds later on, uh, when we get back in January, is that the elements in a given group have very similar properties. So for example, let's say you had a, a process where you were using argon for something um, and you didn't have any argon, you ran out um, and you needed something similar that you could use for a similar purpose. Um, one of these other noble gases, because they would have similar properties, would probably do the trick. It may not always be the case, but generally speaking, elements in the same group will have similar properties. They have similar numbers of valence electrons. Um, they, they will do similar things for you. Um, so I think that answered both Emma's and Cassie's question. Hi, Cass. I hope you're feeling better. Um, and let's talk a little bit more about the periodic table. So I'm going to zoom in here. I'm going to try to see if this will, uh, if my camera will help me. Ah, good. So you can see here at the top of these groups, you can see numbers. Uh, the group numbers can be arranged in a couple different ways. Um, hopefully I'm not too close to the mic. This might be obnoxious. I'm sorry. Um, you can see that there's a number one and there's also the number one a now I want you to pay attention to the, that one a that is one really efficient and useful way to name to number the groups. Um, so we have group one a, we have group two a, which is the alkaline earth metals. Then as we go over here, we have group three a starting with boron four a starting with carbon five a starting with nitrogen six a starting with oxygen. 7A with fluorine and 8A starting with helium, the noble gases. So uh, those numbers are really significant uh, because those numbers will help us determine the number of valence electrons in those in those atoms. Uh, that is the number of electrons in the outermost energy level. Now, once we get into now, I know you all all you honors kids have been doing the electron configurations and stuff like that, and it's important to know where those electrons go. It's important to understand how they're arranged. But I'm going to tell you, and, and I, I don't want to blow this for, for Mr. Hands here, but the only electrons we're going to care about after this test are the valence electrons. They're the only ones that matter because those are the ones that take part in chemical bonds. Those are the part, those are the ones that are responsible for all of the reactivity that we're going to study. So bonds happen when electrons are shared when electrons are given up by one atom and when electrons are taken up by another. That's that's really most of what chemistry is all about. So, um, so um, let's now talk about periodic trends. Um, so there are a few things. Um, I might actually write some of this stuff down. Um, I do have my handy clipboard here, which I'm pretty sure I need to return to Mrs. Johnson. Don't tell her. I'll totally return it. Um, and I'm thinking it would be useful to kind of jot down some of these periodic trends so that we kind of know what we're getting into. Now, um, we tricked you a little bit uh, when we had you do an activity where you graphed the periodic properties. Um, um, so to answer Michael's question, columns are groups and rows are periods. That is absolutely correct. Uh, columns go up and down, periods go across. So that's actually a really nice segue to talking about periodic trends because in addition to being able to tell us the chemical symbol, in addition to being able to tell us the atomic number and the mass um, and the number of valence electrons, some of the properties of these substances, their state of matter, things like that. The periodic table can also help us understand how the properties of different elements compare to one another. So um, 
we tricked you a little bit when we did that um, that periodic table graphing activity. Uh, that's something that we've been using for a bunch of years, and we kind of tweaked it um, because some of those properties that we had you um, graph were actually you, you actually can't establish really reliable trends for them. You, you notice that the numbers were kind of all over the place. Like the graphs didn't make much sense. And to be honest, that was kind of intentional. We wanted to show you some non-examples to show you that not all of these properties can be predicted simply by their position on the periodic table. But there are three in particular that almost always can. One of them, and I'll start with this since, uh, since I was asked about it, is electronegativity. So let's start there. So electronegativity basically is the a measure of the ability of an atom to attract electrons to it in a chemical bond. So the higher the electronegativity, for example, the more that atom will want to draw electrons toward it. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and write that down and we'll, uh, we'll talk about the trend. So, um, so as we go across the periodic table, um, we go from metals. Um, so your metals are generally going to be on the left side of the periodic table over here. Um, and so the, the metals here are going to tend to lose electrons when they react. They do not want to attract electrons because they have very few valence electrons to begin with. It's much easier for them to lose electrons to react um, than to gain them. So metals generally have very low electronegativity values. Um, as you get further away, as, as electrons get further away, as the atoms get bigger as you go down a group, it also becomes harder for the, the protons, for the, the nucleus, to attract those electrons. So they can't do it as well. Um, as you go all the way across from left to right, these atoms here, uh, let's take chlorine for an example. Chlorine wants electrons and it wants them bad. Um, because the way that chlorine reacts, because it has seven valence electrons, is that it wants to gain another electron. If it gains another electron, it ends up looking like argon. Argon is a noble gas. Argon is super happy because argon has a full outer energy level. It's got eight valence electrons, which is sort of the magic number. You want eight. And so this gains an electron and becomes argon. So th these nonmetals tend to have really high electronegativity values. So to summarize the trend, electronegativity, because those nonmetals on the right side want to gain electrons, it increases across a period. And because the electrons get farther away and the nucleus can't attract electrons as strongly as you, as the atoms get bigger and bigger, it decreases down a group. So there's the first trend. I'll leave that up for about 20 seconds so people can, uh, can check that out if they need to. So again, electronegativity measures how, how strongly a given atom will attract an electron in a chemical bond. Um, it increases across a period because Nonmetals want electrons real bad, and it decreases down a group because the atoms get bigger and it's harder to attract electrons as the nucleus gets further and further away. Okay, so hopefully that answered part of Avery's question. Um, now the next, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and talk about ionization energy next because ionization energy is sort of related. Um, if you're in my class, you're going to have to forgive me because you've heard this example like this morning, potentially. Um, but ionization energy is the amount of energy required to remove an electron from an atom.
Okay, so let's let's take an example. Um, my wife, my wife, uh, really hates bananas. Like, don't if you ever come to my house, do not bring a banana. She will kick you out, and she will probably throw something at you. Maybe a banana. She gags at the smell of bananas. Do not bake her banana bread unless you want her to hate you forever. So, um, just a minute. I know, I know you're wondering where this is going, but trust me, there's a point. So, when we talk about ionization energy, let's talk about bananas. My wife hates bananas. If you were to come into our house and ask for a banana. Let's say we had bananas, which we don't. Um, but if we had bananas and you asked her for a banana, she would be like, here, take all my bananas. I don't want them. So it would be really easy to get a banana from my wife because she doesn't like bananas. And so it wouldn't take a lot of energy. It wouldn't take a lot of effort. So electrons can be thought of in the same way. Um, those same metals, the ones on the left-hand side of the periodic table, I'll go ahead and point to them again. So these guys, they do not want electrons. And so if you, and actually they react by losing electrons. We're going to find out a lot more about that in January. But since they react by losing electrons anyway, they want to get rid of them. And so it doesn't take a lot of energy to get rid of those electrons. If you want to rip an electron off a, an atom of sodium, for example, it's not going to take a lot of energy to do that. So just like my wife will not put up a fight if you want to take a banana from her, those metals will not put up, put up a fight really to get those electrons removed from them. So uh, metals tend to have very low ionization energies for that reason. Um, and... The non-metals, so these guys here, for example, um, on the right side of the periodic table, their whole thing is to react by gaining electrons. They want to get as many electrons as they possibly can. So um, they certainly don't want to lose them, and they want to hold on to the ones that they have for dear life. So let's say that instead of my wife who wants to give up those bananas very, very readily. Let's imagine that we are trying to take those bananas from a gorilla. Now, I think you can agree that gorillas enjoy bananas and gorillas are also very strong. So if you tried to take a banana from a gorilla, you might die. And at the very least, it's going to be very hard. It will take a lot of energy. It will take a lot of effort and it will not do. It will not go very well. So, um, geez, sorry guys. Um, so, um, where was I? That kid's dumb. Um, so in terms of ionization energy, non-metals like fluorine, chlorine, things like that, even the noble gases, they have very high ionization energy. So um, the trend for ionization energy is pretty much exactly the same. It's a little less reliable because there's some weird electron stuff going on, but we don't need to get into that. It's going to do the same thing. It's going to increase across a period because it becomes very hard for electrons to be taken off of a non-metal atom as you go across a period. And it decreases as you go down a group because the electrons get further and further away and it takes much less energy to rip them off. So again, I'll leave this here for a second. Um, ionization energy is the amount of energy required to remove an electron from an atom. Metals want to do that. So it doesn't take a lot of energy. Non-metals don't want to do that. So it, it requires a good amount of energy. Um, and ionization energy, as, as you can see here, increases across a period and decreases as you go down a group. So um, 
Michael, I'm glad you uh, appreciated my Borat reference. Um, there are certain references from that movie I cannot make. Um, that final scene in Borat in particular still gives me horrible, horrible nightmares um, where they chase each other around the hotel. I don't even want to think about it. Why did you make me think about that? Okay, so... Um, Last property we need to really worry about here is atomic radius. So we can think of atomic radius as really the size of the atom. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that we're just going to define it that way. Um, the larger the atomic radius, the larger the atom. It's a little more complicated than that, but only a little. Um, we know that the radius in geometry, for example, was the the distance from the nucleus, the center of the atom, to the outermost electrons. So um, that's basically what we're working here. The, the atomic radius is very similar to the radius of a circle, except now we're talking about the middle of the atom, the nucleus, and the outside, which is those valence electrons. And for those of you who don't remember, um, the valence electrons are the electrons on the outermost energy level. Um, so the atomic radius gets a little complicated. So I want you to imagine a scenario where we have, um, let's say, let's say we clone Jack Nolan. Um, shout out to Jack. So let's, let's clone Jack Nolan and let's clone him 11 times. Now, th those 11 identical Jack Nolans are meant to represent the 11 protons in an atom of sodium. Sodium has an atomic number of 11, and it has 11 protons as a result. You'll remember that sodium is an alkali metal right here, and it's got those 11 protons. So those 11 protons are going to pull on the 11 neutron, uh, 11 neutrons, 11 electrons that go around that nucleus in their electron clouds. And that's how the electrons actually stay associated with that atom. If that, if that attractive force didn't exist, electrons would just be flying off into space and we all would have exploded a long time ago. I don't want to think about it. So those 11, those 11 protons will pull with a certain amount of force. Now, if we go all the way across that period, let's say we, we have... 18 Jack Nolans this time, and that represents the 18 protons in an argon atom. Um, if we were to engage in a tug of war with those two, the 18 Jack Nolans would clearly win. Um, and those 18 Jack Nolans um, are very, very strong indeed. Um, so the same thing happens with an atom of sodium, which has 11 protons pulling on those 11 electrons, and an atom of argon, which has 18 protons pulling on those 18 electrons in an argon atom. Um, so as long as they're within the same period, the further over you get, so as you go from left to right, atoms actually get smaller because they actually... Are, those electrons are pulled with more force by the nucleus because of that increase in charge. So um, the atomic radius actually decreases across a period. It's, an op it's the opposite trend to the other two that we've been talking about. And the reason for that, again, is that you have these additional protons that are pulling with more force on those electrons. Um, so then we have... Um, the atomic radius, which increases as we go down a group, because as you go, as you go down a group, you add energy levels. Um, the valence electrons in the second period, for example, go into the second energy level. The valence electrons in the third period go into the third energy level and so on. You kind of get the trend here. And so... As you go down and you're adding those energy levels, those energy levels take up more space. So the atomic radius increases as you go down a group. Um, so I'm going to put this up on the screen in just a minute so we can sort all this out. 
So the atomic radius, again, is roughly equivalent to the size of the atom. That's a good wor working definition for now. We'll keep it real simple. Um, it decreases as you go across a period, and it increases as you go down a group. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I think that pretty much covers what we need to know. And if there are any further questions, feel free to ask. Um, Emma, thank you for reminding me. I did promise that I would send out the answer key for the study guide. Um, feel free to send it to anyone you like, but I'm just going to send it to my class because those are the emails that I have. Um, so I will, as soon as I sign off here, I'll go ahead and, and send that email. Um, I'll send it to 1A tonight and probably 1B tomorrow. Uh, just a reminder to my class, I'm asking you to do the completion section as well as 20 of the other questions on the review. Um, obviously, there's nothing stopping you from just filling in the answer key, but I'd like to think you're going to do the stuff, then check your answers. Um, so let me double check. Um, I think I answered Katie's question about valence electrons. Um, so... Um, let's, uh, I got a few minutes, so let's talk, um, and my guys, you can probably tune this out, or at least don't let this part freak you out, because, uh, we have a question from Lauren Brooks from our honors class about the Aufbau principle, Hund's rule, and the Pauli exclusion principle. Those are all tons of fun. So, um, the Aufbau principle, um, it, it literally comes from a German word that means building up. And the Aufbau principle just sort of governs the way electrons fill orbitals. So the, the principle is basically that electrons fill orbitals of lowest energy first. So they fill in order of increasing energy. So the 1s sublevel, for example, that you filled in first would be the lowest in energy and you would gradually go up there. Um, you can probably find, if you if you do a quick Google search, you can find a diagram that sort of walks you through um, the Aufbau principle. I usually, you know, will pass out a diagram where they just kind of follow a sequence, 1s, 2s, 2p, et cetera, um, and help, it sort of helps to kind of figure out where the energy levels go. There's also a really, a, a pretty easy way, once you get the hang of it, of kind of putting that stuff on the periodic table. Uh, or using the periodic table to figure out where these things belong, um, which takes some time, but once you get used to it, it's pretty pretty straightforward. Um, so Hund's rule uh, basically says that you can only put two electrons in any given orbital, um, and that electrons should be... Actually, no, never mind. So Hund's rule does say that you can only put two electrons in any given orbital. Uh, the Pauli exclusion principle, which is sort of related to that, basically says that you could you could get a little deeper, but it basically says that the electrons in any in any sublevel, like say the two p sublevel, which has three orbitals, you'd have to put one electron in each sublevel before you put a second in any of them. Um, and so that and that is because electrons spin in opposite directions. And if they spun in the same direction within the same orbital, they would repel each other and basically the atom would explode. We don't want that. Um, so pa Wolfgang Pauli, uh, who was the, I believe, Austrian scientist who came up with that, basically said that because those electrons spin in opposite directions, you can only have one at a time before you put in a second. Um, hopefully that clears that up. Basically, those are the rules that kind of govern electron configuration. I think there's probably videos out there that explain it better, like Khan Academy or Crash Course or something like that. Might be worth looking looking at that if you um, if you need more help. To be honest, I'm a little rusty. Haven't taught honors in a bunch of years. Um, we don't necessarily go into them that much detail. So um, sorry, I can't do a little bit more. Um, so ions and isotopes. Uh, so ions are atoms of a given element that have a charge. So ions are formed when atoms 
lose electrons to become positively charged. That means they have fewer protons, fewer protons than electrons. Or nope. Let me back up. So if you have a positively charged ion, that means that you've lost electrons and you now have fewer electrons than you do protons. So you have more positive charges than negative charges. If an atom gains electrons, that means that you now have more electrons than protons and you have more negative charges. A, a really easy way to figure out the charge on an ion would be to take the number of protons subtract the number of electrons. Um, so for instance, if I had um, an ion of potassium with 19 protons, because every atom of potassium has 19 protons, and say 18 electrons, because it lost one, then the charge on that ion would be 19 minus 18, or positive one. Um, then, so hopefully that explains ions. So an ion is an atom with a charge, basically, when you gain or lose electrons. An isotope, or isotopes, I should say, usually we talk about them in the plural, are different forms of the same element with the same atomic number, but different mass numbers. So um, let, me, let me write down a couple examples here. Um, you've probably seen this before, but uh, usually when we talk about an isotope, we name it, and we give the mass number afterwards. So the mass number, you'll remember, is the sum of protons and neutrons. Um, so we have carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. Um, all of these, the thing they have in common is the number of protons. They all, because they are carbon, have six protons. Carbon has an atomic number of six, means that every single atom has... Every single atom of carbon in the world has six protons. If it doesn't, it's not carbon. The difference here is the number of, of neutrons. So we would get that by figuring out the taking the mass and subtracting the atomic number. So in this case, in the case of our carbon isotopes, and sorry, it's a little messy here, um, we have six protons and six neutrons in an atom of carbon-12, six protons and seven neutrons in an atom of carbon-13, six protons and eight neutrons in an atom of carbon-14. Um, so again, isotopes are different forms of the same atom, different atoms of the same element that have different neutrons and therefore different mass numbers. Um, so then... Um, Cassie asked, would radon be the heaviest noble gas? Yes, it would. Uh, the masses of, of the elements go increase as you go down the periodic table. You can actually look at the mass on the periodic table. I have no problem with that. Uh, so as you go down, things get heavier. So radon would be the heaviest noble gas. Good call. Um, how many groups are there? Um, basically, there are 18 groups. Um, the ones we're really concerned about right now are the eight groups on the outside, what we call the, the representative elements, the ones that have an A next to them, um, because those are the ones that are sort of most predictable. We can predict the number of um, valence electrons. We can do a lot of different things with those. Um, so em Emma is asking a question specifically from the study guide. So in going top to bottom of any group, each element has how many more occupied energy levels than the element above? The answer, of course, is one. Um, so we add an energy level every time we go down a group, which is part of the reason that the atomic radius increases, uh, which is part of the reason that the electronegativity decreases because it's harder to attract an electron. A lot of the properties that we see, a lot of the trends we see going down a group actually have a lot to do with the fact that you're adding one more energy level every time you go down. Um, so let's see. How are we doing? It looks like we're in pretty good shape here. Um, so there's still 19 of you left. We're about 51 minutes in. Um, I'll give you another 30 seconds or so to come up with any questions you might have. And otherwise, I might go ahead and sign off early because uh, I've been talking for almost two hours. If you uh, if you actually survived both this and the anatomy live stream before this, um, I don't know. I feel like I should probably give you an A on this thing. I'm not going to, but I kind of feel like I should. Um, but seriously, props for uh, 
sticking with it this long because my voice is tired. I'm going to go uh, just veg out for a little bit after this. Um, so again, any questions you have? Uh, there's been a lot of great stuff. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming in and doing this, guys, uh, except for that one dude. Um, but uh, if you have any more questions, hit me up. I'll wait about 30 more seconds and then we'll uh, call it a night. So again, thanks for, uh, thanks for all the good stuff. Hopefully uh, this will be helpful to you. All right, so looks like we're in pretty good shape. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. I'm going to send my class the uh, a copy of the review, at least to my 1A crew. So uh, I will. I Don't worry, I will. I got you, Emma. Um, and for you guys, I'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning. For my 1B, I will see you bright and early on Friday morning. And for the rest of you, if you're not in my class, good luck. I hope this helped. Um Feel free to hit me up for any additional questions over the next couple days. And uh, good luck. Study hard. Get some sleep. Help your parents. Have a great night. Thanks for watching.